for this module we'll focus on the fundamentals and concept of MAS or marker assisted selection so in the current scheme of things or in the conventional scheme of things uh, breeders would start off with two varieties you cross them in that case the A and B represent the pollen grains X and Y represent the ovules so you have a donor plant which is donating the pollen and the recipient plant which is basically receiving the pollen and then you develop your fruits and you get your seeds and so on and so forth. Now conventionally you assume Mendelian inheritance. Okay, So you have A, B, X, Y and then you will get various combinations of A, B and X and Y. This is the Mendelian inheritance pattern. Now a breeder has a different approach to this problem. He will breed using conventional method. However, he will also undertake a process known as recruitment. So if you can view the square which is green with CZ, CZ represents a recruit. A recruit is basically wild type, wild type germ plasm. So you, you cross over CZ with the current combination of the F1 generation. So when you have F2, which is basically the recruit crossed over with AX, AY, BX and BY, you will have a greater variation. That's the logic of breeding. Okay? So that's the basis for developing new hybrids. So once you have the recruit, you will also, as I mentioned to you earlier, the concept of linkage drive. Right? There will be some genes in the recruit which are undesirable, which will carry forward into your generation your pedigree lines. Okay, so the marker assisted selection is founded on a molecular technique which is PCR based amplification of the genes. So you have identified or the breeder has identified specific genes which can be attributed to specific traits. So they have a relationship between genotype and phenotype. So what the breeder will do is amplify these genes in the progeny and test for inheritance pattern. So if they are inherited in the genotype, they will select those plants for further breeding cycles. If they are not present, they will cull the plant or they will terminate the plants at those levels. So this reduces the investment in space for breeding experiments. Now in the case of marker assist selection, it's very important to identify markers or PCR loci which flank a trait. Okay? The reason why we do this is because we are anticipating recombination. For instance, in the, at the top of the slide you will see the trait and you can see the first marker RA which is located at a distance of 5 centimorgans from the trait. Assuming that I developed a PCR primer for that locus RA and assuming that, was, that there was no genetic recombination of no crossover chromosome, this trait will carry forward into the next generation. But let us assume a case in which the recombination event occurred between RA and the trait. Okay? They were separated during the process of recombination. Then I will obtain a PCR product and I do amplification. However, the trait has been lost. So in order to overcome this shortcoming, you need to have two. So you need to have marker A and marker B. Marker A and marker B both flank a specific trait. So when you have a successive breeding cycles, you need to get both markers A and B in order to give you the certainty that the trait has been transmitted. That's the concept of mass. So for instance, you may have six genes encoding one trait. So six trait. So in that case, you need to develop 12 markers okay, and ensure that these markers are amplified in PCR over subsequent generation. So that's traceability. Okay, so these are cases which you may have. So as you can see, F0 is the zero starting generation in which you have the parent, which is in red and the parent recipient which is in blue. So red is the donor, blue is the recipient. So they have these markers, so A, B and X, Y. So that's F, F0. So I will take the four plants, the, sorry, the two plants and I will basically amplify these loci A, B, X, Y. 
in the F1 generation, all my markers show the presence of all the traits. So we, we infer simple Mendelian inheritance. In the F2, we also get amplification of all the four loci in the PCR product. So we have inheritance. However, in the F3, A, X and Y amplify the markers. However, B does not. So we can assume recombination because the trait has been lost or the marker associated with that specific trait has been lost as a result of recombination. And finally, in the F4 generation, you again have X and Y, but A and B are not present. So when you amplify it, you got two PCR products and the remaining products are not present. So it means that the trait has been lost, likely to be the result of genetic recombination. However, you should be careful of one thing. If there is a mutation in your primer binding site for that marker as a result of natural mutation processes, then you will again end up in a situation where your trait is inherited, but your marker may not amplify. So your confidence level is determined not only by recombination, but also by mutation. So mass has several advantages. The first one is screening. You can screen all your F1 hybrids to determine which is the one that carries the trait and which can be incorporated into subsequent experiments. So you reduce your size involved in the greenhouse. So if you have one greenhouse, like you, uh, you, as I mentioned earlier, you start off with one hectare of land, but when you end up with the F3 of F4 generation, you'll end up with about 100 hectares of land, which is not manageable in the breeding context. So you need to reduce the space involved in development of uh, hybrids. Okay, applications of mass is basically pyramiding. You can evaluate genetic material for specific traits and you can develop what is known as combined mass in which you combine the marker assisted selection with selection based on phenotype. You can do double selection. So you can also use markers to evaluate. For instance, you uh, obtain germplasm or seeds from another country which has certain claims. They say this plant, this seed is going to give you high yield. You can ass assess these traits by finding markers associated with that plant. So you don't have to uh, basically uh, sow the seeds and obtain the crop and then you realize it's not true to type. You can screen out at an earlier stage using markers. And it can be also used for marker assisted back crossing which we will discover as we go through in the next set of slides. Okay. In marker assisted back crossing, we have the same scheme in which you have AB and XY. Okay. So you cross AB and XY. AB is the elite variety, XY is the wild type. And then you obtain that combination of F1 hybrid, which is AX, AY, BX and BY. Now in order to dilute the influence of XY, which is the wild variety, you back cross. So in the F2, you again get a combination of variants, which inherit genes in the Mendelian manner. However, the percentage of genes from the wild variety will reduce over subsequent generations. Okay, I will demonstrate this to you using this graphic. So you crossed two varieties, so you have the wild type and green is the elite, red is the wild type. In the F1 generation, you will have a 50-50 combination. As you can see, there is a circle, concentric circle with red and green, there is a 50-50. Now I cross with the same recurrent variety which is the elite. Okay? The next generation will contain 75-25 by logic. So then I cross again. So the next F3 will basically have a smaller percentage of the wild variety. So this is quantitative and you can trace this process using markers. For instance, if your trait for which you desired from the wild type is in that 12.5%, you can still trace it using markers. I will give you an example. For instance, my wild type variety is drought tolerant. My elite variety, which is green, is high yielding. 
I then crossed over the trades. And then the marker for drought tolerance is incorporated in the red. For instance, I did F1 and the marker still gives evidence of PCR. In a PCR based system, you can identify the marker. In F2, I can identify the marker. However, when I did a PCR with generation F3, the marker is lost, which means I should stop at F2. So F2 is the ideal optimal plant which has the uh, characteristics of the elite as well as the characteristics of the wild type. Okay. So that's the logic for recurrent parents or back crossing. Okay. Another aspect is marker assisted pyramiding in which we work with several varieties to obtain a single plant. Okay. The concept of pyramiding is this as follows. So at the top of the slide you will see red, blue, blue and yellow, the four varieties. So these need to be crossed and into a single hybrid uh, pedigree line. So the, the concept is as follows, you cross the first two varieties, you obtain the first generation, you do it, repeat the same procedure for the other two varieties, you obtain these purple and green varieties which are the F1 and then you cross that F1 to obtain F2. Okay. So you can do this with any number of varieties at a starting point. You can start off with 16 varieties and divide them into groups of 8 groups of 2 each and breed, inbreed them and so on and so forth. So in this case there's 4 varieties so you require 2 breeding cycles. Okay, so there are some other variants of mass, for example early generation mass. So you can basically screen for plants which may not be known in terms of their genotype. Okay. So you can screen using random primers, isolate loci and then link them to specific traits. You have combined mass. So in this case you combine the traits which are phenotypically visible with the genotype. And when we come down to the reasons why marker assisted selection is still not widely used is because most of the marker assisted selection experiments are done commercially and they are not revealed to the general public. So breeders do not publish their data because it's competing with other breeders. So the breeding, uh, the plant breeding industry is basically a global in industry. You have Monsanto, Cargill, all the big seed giants. They do not disclose this data because it will reveal information to their competitors because they have sequenced a significant number of genomes but these genomes are not publicly disclosed. The genomes which you see in publications are the ones which are developed by researchers like we have at that institute. However, the commercial data is not available because they have developed linkages between a significant number of genes and a significant number of traits. So mass results are not published because they are commercially high value data. The second reason is mass requires a large number of experiments in order to achieve statistical reliability. So when you develop markers, QTLs, you have to undergo rigorous statistical tests to determine whether these markers are retained over subsequent generations. That's another reason why mass is expensive and less popular among traditional researchers. Sometimes there may be lack of linkage or low degree of linkage between the locus and the gene. That's another reason why mass is expensive. And because genomes of plants are complex and they are very difficult to sequence, large, the large uh, proportion of the genome is non-coding and repetitive. So these genomes are difficult to sequence and assemble. So there is a lack of data with regard to genomes. However, this is improving as more and more genomes are sequenced. This will change in the future. Probably in the future you can link a set of genes or the suite of genes to a specific traits. Okay. 
Another aspect is epistasis, or what we call genetic background, in which you have genetic interaction and the genetic background affects the trait. Another one is environment. For example, a plant variety which is grown in a temperate climate may exhibit different characteristics in a tropical climate, primarily because the gene expression profile will change with temperature and climate. So there's an environmental effect. So if you developed a marker for plants which are the same plant in different regions of the world, you may have different phenotypes, okay? even though the genotype is similar and this is linked to environmental effects. And the cost of development of marker is very high because you have to test it over subsequent generations. And there is an application gap because when we develop markers, there is also intellectual property associated with the marker. So if for instance, you found a marker linked to a certain trait. You will want, you wouldn't like to release it to the open source community. Like, you'll try to commercialize it because you have spent a lot of money on developing that marker. You wouldn't like to release it. So that's an application gap. And there's a knowledge gap. So sometimes fundamental concepts are not understood by farmers and breeders. So. There are breeders who are molecular breeders who understand the concept very clearly. However, farmers do not understand concept and some farmers may be involved in developing their own hybrids. However, they follow traditional approaches. They don't use marker as to selection because of the cost. So, marker as to selection is utilized for a process known as gene pyramiding which I explained to you in which you can combine the traits from four or more than four plants into a single determinate hybrid and how this is done is as, is as follows so you have in this case you have six different varieties so these six different varieties are termed as founder parents so you focus on the terminology which is used in the slide the first six varieties are termed as founder parents So these are then crossed over. So example, the progeny of P1 and P2 is H12. After you cross these two varieties, you have the next generation, which is termed as the node. So the node is a crossover of the F1, H1, H2, H3, H4 to develop H1234, which carries the 25% of each and finally you have a root genotype which is developed by crossing over all these three varieties okay and then the root genotype is basically classified as a pedigree line because you know the pedigree you know the parents you know the grandparents and you can link it all together so then you get a pedigree line and finally you have a idiotype an idiotype is a self cross. Okay. A self cross. So P1, P2 were crossed over. You got H12, H34, H56. Then you got a node which is developed by crossing H12 with H34, the next generation. Then you have F3 which is developed by crossing H1234 with H56. And you develop what is known as the root genotype. After the root genotype is developed, you cross, you self cross. You don't allow it to cross pollinate then you develop the idiotype. Now the idiotype is subsequently self-pollinated. So you have a hybrid which is closed. So basically you close the gap. You develop a new variety and on which you have control. And then this is the one which you distribute to farmers and which you commercialize. Now this entire scheme, you can use marker assisted selection to track the traits. Okay, so if in H1, P1, P2, you may have certain markers. P3, P4 and P5, P6. So ideally in the root genotype, all the markers from all those traits should be present in order for it to be taken into the next level which is the idiotype. Okay. So that's the way it works. So the arrows show the scheme. So this entire scheme is defined as gene pyramiding scheme. So it's a gene pyramiding scheme.